into the customs of the Tagalogs. Now, these customs of the Tagalogs was written by Father Juan de Plasencia. Now, we will be looking into the life story of Plasencia, a short life story of him. Uh, he was one of the seven children born to the family of Puerto Carreros in Plasencia in Extremadura, Spain. Um, if you are going, if you were able to notice, his name was, or his family name was Plasencia. We could say that one of Plasencia because he was born in Plasencia, Spain. Now, his father was Pedro Puerto Carrero, who was a captain of a Spanish schooner. He entered the Franciscan order and he became a priest during the early his during his early youth if you are going to look into the list of missionaries who came to our country on july 2 1578 he was named Fray juan de puerto carrero placencia got a very significant achievement while he was here in the philippines among which is that uh, his characteristic wherein he tends to visit areas where the natives dwell by foot. Uh, and his great interest focuses on the laborious study of the native language. He was among those uh, first order of missionaries who came to our country that really focuses on the development of the natives, particularly studying their own language, founding numerous towns, not only in Laguna and Tayabas, but also in Bulacan and Rizal. Uh, apart from that, among his other works includes the conversion of the natives into the Catholic faith as well as gathering them into reductions or villages under the special care of the missionaries. You know what? There is a good thing with that particular idea. Huh? He tend to gather all the people into one village, founding a Spanish village. And for the others, it was also a bad thing because for those people who would not go near the village or who would not uh, establish their house or dwellings near the village, uh, they, they are being considered as barbarians. Apart from gathering the natives into villages, he also established numerous primary schools. He was also responsible for forming a grammar and vocabulary texts he was also credited for several ethnological studies. Now, his dedicated years of hard work converting the natives or into Christianity, teaching them Catholicism or catechism, and organizing towns and barangays ended when he died in 1990 at of Laguna. But one of his most significant achievement or work was the compilation of the customs and traditions of our ancestors into an essay or into a work which was named Relacion de las Costumbres or what we call the customs of the Tagalogs. In this particular work, he listed the customs of the Indians uh, which the Indians used to have in the islands and sent it to the governor and captain general of the country, Santiago de Vera, who was also the president of the Royal Odensha. Odensha has many reasons why he did the compilation of the customs of the Indians. But this was, uh, this, this work of Placencia was quite exceptional. What makes it ex exceptional? It's because it preserved to the present generation the formerly unwritten customs, traditions, and beliefs of the natives. In his work, we could see the form of government of our ancestors. We could see there how justice is being administered, uh, how slavery occur, or what are the, uh, the, the things uh, pertaining to slavery, inheritance, how crimes are being punished, and how marriages are being conducted. Now, it was actually the first civil code of the Philippines. Just try to remember, uh, the Spaniards, when they came to our country, they actually, or they do have their own Spanish code, or the Spanish civil code. They brought with them the Spanish civil code in governing the natives. However, uh, 
there were some parts of the Spanish Civil Code that were not applicable to that of the Filipinos. That's why, according to Plasencia, it should be, uh, it should be that this alcaldes mayores and their administration of justice will be guided by the customs of the Tagalogs. Uh, it must be the customs of the Tagalogs that must be followed so that there will be no injustices, uh, so that the, the alcaldes mayores could not commit injustices. Now, in that particular customs of the Tagalogs also, Plasencia tend to describe the unit of government, which is barangay, how it is being ruled by the dato, and the division of the people into three distinct social classes, the maharlika, the aliping na mamahay, and the aliping sa gigilid. Now, this gave the natives the opportunity and this indispensable tool to protect and defend themselves in legal cases. Why? As I mentioned a while ago, there were our ancestors has different ways of dealing things and if they would rely only on the spanish legal code then that would or the spanish civil code that would create problem because the natives have their own system one best example there is that there were although although uh, i mean one best example that is the the idea of alipin uh, our ancestors doesn't have a single idea of alipin because they have two kinds of alipin alipin na mamahay and alipin sa gigilid uh, which means that you cannot treat the two slaves or the two kinds of alipin into just one which the the alcaldes mayores or some other spaniards tend to do uh, they tend to uh, think that an aliping na mamahay is the same with aliping sa gigilid. That's why um, Placentia is giving us or giving those alcaldes mayores an idea of what is the distinction between those two. Now, Placentia's primary objective when he composed the relation was to put an end to some injustices made against the natives by certain government officials. Now, we will be looking into an excerpt of Juan de Placencia's Relacion de las Costumbres. How did Placencia obtain his information on the Tagalogs? Okay, but before I'm going to proceed to answer that question, the idea of the Tagalogs does not only refer to those people living in Luzon or the Tagalog-speaking people. It means people living on the riverbanks or Taga-ilog. That's why when Placentia compiled this, uh, this uh, information on the customs of the Tagalog. He meant not only to refer to the Tagalog people or the Tagalog-speaking people, but he, he meant to refer to all other uh, people living in the uh, whole archipelago of the Philippines during the time. During the time when Placentia composed the customs of the Tagalog, we already have the name Filipinas. Miguel Lopez de Legazpi already gave the name Filipinas to the whole of the archipelago of our country. Now, how did Placentia obtain information pertaining to the customs of the, of the Tagalog? Now, what he did was he collected Indians coming from different districts. He interviewed or asked those Indians, and out of the answers of those Indians, he collected this information pertaining to the government, administration of justice, inheritance, slaves, and dowries. Now, try to understand, class, that the natives during the time of Placentia, or our ancestors during the time of Placentia, were known or were called as, or were being referred to as Indians, okay? Our ancestors were not known as Filipinos or whatsoever. They are known as Indians. We will look into the form of government or the kind of governmental structure that our ancestors during that time or the Indians whom uh, Placentia referred to has during that time. Now, according to Placentia, the people always had chiefs. And the chiefs of the people are known as datos or dato. The dato governed the people and he was considered to be the captain in wars. That's why the people 
need to obey and need to pay reverence to the dato. And any subject who commit any offense against the dato or spoke a word to the wives and children of the dato were being punished severely. Now, some dato ruled uh, a, a group of people as many as hundred houses while some dato ruled sometimes even less than 30. Uh, there, were, there were barangays, the tribal gathering which we call barangay was composed of either 100 houses or less than 100 houses wherein uh, it may be composed of less than 30 houses. Of course, the term barangay comes from a boat called balangay. Now, apart from the dato, the barangay also were composed or was composed of different social classes or there were three castes or social castes that composed the barangay. Uh, they were the nobles, the commoners, and the slaves. Now, the nobles were the freeborn or the maharlika. Uh, they were considered to be the most privileged among the other classes because they did not pay taxes or they did not pay tax or tribute to the dato. They are actually free men. They could do whatever they want because they don't need to pay tax or tribute to the dato. But there's one thing that they need to do, uh, and that is, or that was to accompany the dato in war. They do that at their own expense. But of course, they are always compensated with that because before uh, they go to war, the dato would offer them a feast, and after the war, the dato would divide the spoils among themselves. That's the privilege of the nobles. Now, apart from the nobles, there were also the aliping namamahay. But this were not just an ordinary aliping namamahay. They were considered to be the commoners. The aliping namamahay need to give service to his master. This aliping namamahay could marry. Uh, they need to serve their master. And uh, apart from that, they live in their own houses and they are considered to be lords of their property and gold. Uh, their children inherit the gold or the property that they have and they enjoy their property and lands. This, this kind of situation is in contrast with the aliping sagigilid. Now why? Because this aliping sagigilid were the ones being considered as slaves or they were the real slaves. But unlike the slaves in other countries, ours is not a fixed status. It's not fixed, hindi siya permanente. Why? Why? Uh, bakit hindi siya permanente? Because there is a chance or an opportunity for a slave or a leaping sagigili to free himself and become an aliping namamahay. Now, we will try to describe first what an aliping sagigili is. Now, uh, one primary thing that you could say about the Aliping Sagigilid is that they serve their master in his house, meaning they are living in the of their masters. Among the characteristics of the Aliping Sagigilid was that uh, they, they live in their master's house, they cultivate the land of their masters, and they could be sold by their masters. Okay? Now, of course, uh, there were some uh, slaves also or aliping sagigili that were very good with their masters and their masters loved them. That's why some of them were even given portions of the uh, harvest. But the idea there is uh, they could be sold anytime by their masters. Now, there were several reasons how a person would become slave. Now, one, one thing there is that uh, those people that are considered to be captives of war become slave. Or when they were born as slave, from the time that they were born, they are already considered as slaves. Then they could serve as slaves. But another thing is, those people who commit debts, when they have debts and they cannot pay their debt, uh, debtors, 
they would become slave. That's one of the most common reasons how a person would become slave. If they cannot pay, then they would become slave. And if the person died, for example, it was the father and the mother who was able to commit debts and they died without paying the debts, then they, their children would become slaves. Of course, that would not happen now because our constitution prohibits slavery by debts. Uh, it will not happen today. But that was a common thing before. The only thing there is, the only good thing there, if we're going to compare that with other societies in the world, if they have the money to pay for the debts, then they could ransom themselves. When they ransom themselves, then they would become an aliping namamahay or what we call commoner. Now that's how a slave or that's how a person would become a slave. Now we'll try to look into other situations also on which uh, a person become a slave, particularly on the idea of the maharlikas. You know, the ancient Filipino society, or yeah, uh, there, there, there is no fixed. Huh? The ancient Filipino society is not fixed. Uh, it's not the kind of society in India wherein if you are a Brahmin until the day, at the end of your life, you will become a Brahmin. But it's not the same with the Philippines. Now, in our case, uh, if there, there were certain instances that a Maharlika could also become a slave. Of course, apart from they will become captives of war someday, the point there is that could happen through marriage. Now, uh, a Maharlika who has both the father and the mother's side as Maharlika would continue to be Maharlika forever. Uh, the point there is, if your mother and father are Maharlika, forever you would be considered as Maharlika. But that would change if one of your parents is a Maharlika and the other one is a slave. And that would happen through marriage. If the Maharlikas had children among their, their slaves, there is a tendency that the slave and their mothers would become free. Okay? However, there were certain instances wherein if a, ma if a father who was a Maharlika has a child with a mother who was a slave of another uh, master, slave woman ne need to pay her master for the period wherein he could not work. Uh, he's going, she's going to pay the period for her inability to labor during the pregnancy. And if in such case, half of the child was free and the other one was not. Like for example, there was a, uh, a, a Maharlika man who uh, has a child with a slave woman. If the Maharlika man recognizes uh, the child of the slave woman, then the child would become half Maharlika and half slave. But if the Maharlika man did not recognize the child of the slave woman, then the child would become a full slave. Now, that is the, the same true also with a Maharlika woman. If a Maharlika woman had children with a slave man, and the Maharlika woman recognizes the slave man as her husband, then the children would be half slave and half maharlika. Now, the only the if the slave woman did not recognize the a husband, uh, the slave man as a husband, then all the children would be considered as maharlika or free. That would be advantageous on the part of the children uh, if the mother will not recognize her husband na slave. Now we go to another situation here. If two persons married, one was Maharlika and the other was a slave, the children will be divided. If a Maharlika woman and a, a slave man married each other, the children would be divided. The first child, whether male or female, 
belong to the father as well as the third and the fifth, while the second child, the fourth and the sixth, belong to the manor. Now, in this particular case, if the father was a maharlika, then all those children that belongs to him, like the first, the third, and the fifth, were considered to be maharlika, and those who belong to the mother would be considered as slave. What if it was the mother who was the maharlika and it was the father who was the slave? Therefore, if it was the mother who was the maharlika, the second child, the fourth and the sixth child would become maharlika, while the first, the fifth, and the third would become slaves. Now, that's the consequence of a parent or the, that's the, 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 that would happen to the children if their parents were not full maharlika or not full slave. That's why it was mentioned there a while ago that in order for a maharlika to become maharlika forever, then his or her parents should be both maharlika. Okay? Now, we go into how justice and sentences are being rendered. Now, uh, investigations were made and sentences were passed by the dato in the presence of those of his barangay. That's how they render justice in the barangay. If any of the litigants or litigants feel aggrieved, they choose an arbiter coming from another village or barangay. That arbiter may either be a dato or not. Okay, that's how they do. And if they, if there are controversies between two chiefs, then what they did was they also uh, seek judgment or judges coming from other barangays. Now, for inheritance, the legitimate children would always inherit equally, except in cases where the father and mother showed slight partiality by giving another uh, child more than what he owed to inherit from the parents. Now, of course, when a child or when a son married uh, a woman, particularly if the son would marry the chief's daughter, then the parents would give their son a dowry in which that son would give that dowry to the parents of the woman. Now, where did the dowry came from? The dowry art actually came from the inheritance of the son, meaning the dowry that the son would give to the, the parents of uh, the woman that he's going to marry actually comes from his own inheritance. And after that, that inheritance will be shared equally or maybe partially among his legitimate children and illegitimate children. And there are, if you're going to read the particular portion, there are certain criteria where or how a particular inheritance will be given to a child who is considered to be legitimate or a child who is not considered to be legitimate or uh, children that comes from the inaasawa or inaasaba. Okay? Now, try to look into this part. Dowries are given by men to the women's parents. That's what I said a while ago. It was actually men who give dowries and they give that not to the women, but they give that to the parents of the women. It's like a form, uh, we cannot say it directly, but it's like a form of payment to the parents for uh, making, for, for, for what? For taking care of the woman. Now, of course, if the parents are living, then they will be enjoying so much of the dowry that was given uh, to them. Now, what would happen if the parents of the woman died? Now, if the parents died and the dowry was not consumed by the parents, the dowry will be distributed equally among of the parents of the woman. Okay, all of them would benefit from the dowry. Why? Because try to remember, class, that during that period, women are not allowed to own a property, a land, or dowry. All their, all their fruits of labors belongs to their parents. 
Now, what if? What if the woman doesn't have parents during the time of he, of her marriage? Now, that's a very this uh, that's a very advantageous thing to the woman because if she doesn't have parents during or grandparents during the time of her marriage, then that's the time that she could enjoy the dowry. That's the time that she could uh, use of the dowry. That is particular in a case where uh, she doesn't have relative or child because if she got a child there is a tendency that the child would go or i mean the dowry would go to the child now what if uh, they the the husband and wife committed divorce now if they committed divorce uh, if it was the wife that left the husband for the purpose of marrying another uh, man then the, the wife should return all the dowry and an equal additional amount to the husband. Meaning, apart from returning the dowry, the wife still needs to pay the same amount to the husband. Now, what if the wife left the husband but did not marry? Now, if the wife left the husband but did not marry, then the only thing that the wife should do is return the dowry. Meaning, if kung pila man na, kung ano ka dako ang dowry, naging hatag sa husband dati, that would be, that must be returned by the wife. Now, what if it was the husband that left the wife? Now, if it was the husband that left the wife, then what would happen is, uh, they are going to uh, make, uh, they are going to take a portion of the dowry. Half of the dowry will be returned to the husband, and half of the dowry will be retained by the wife. It will not be returned fully because it's not the fault of the wife. It was the fault of the husband. But if they have children at the time of the divorce, then the, the whole dowry, uh, the man or the husband and the wife could not share of the dowry because the whole dowry will be, re will be given to the children apart from that. Uh, the husband also or the father would pay fine to the children. And who would take care of the dowry and the fine? It will be the grandparents or other responsible relatives. Now those were the things mentioned by Antonio, I mean by Juan de Placencia. Or those, those were the things mentioned by Juan de Placencia in pertaining to the customs of the uh, Tagalogs. Uh, in which included with that were the, the, the form of government, the inheritance, the dowry, and the social uh, classes in the society. Now this time, we will go into the second relation or the second part of the uh, work of uh, Juan de Placencia. Uh, we will be looking into the uh, worship of the Tagalogs, their gods, and their burials and superstitions. Now, Placentia tend to tell us that our ancestors practice idolatry, meaning they adore idols or they tend to worship idols. They also tend to celebrate uh, festivals uh, in honor of these idols. But our ancestors, according to Placentia, doesn't have temples or place of worship. Although they have simbahan, this simbahan was actually like uh, the, the, the simbahan or the temple that they are using or uh, where they are celebrating their festival or worship, that is from the house of the, the large house of a chief, wherein what they are doing was that they are putting a roof or an extension roof to the house known as CB to protect them from wet when it rained. They also construct, or they, they also set small lumps known as torehili, and they try to make certain designs that would convert the house of the chief into a temple where they could join in worship in a process called nagaanitos. As I mentioned, they believe on many idols, and of course, the chief of those idols was Bathala whom they call all-powerful or maker of all things. But apart from Bathala, they worship the sun, they worship the moon, they worship the morning star known as Tala, 
they have mapulon or the change of seasons, and they have balatik or the greater beer. Apart from that, they possess many idols known as likha, in which among those idols, they have the anmasalanta or the patron of lovers and of generation, and they have also the idol lakapati or the patron of cultivated lands, and the idol ijanale or the patron of husbandry. They also paid reverence to water lizards or the buaya or crocodiles and other things. Now, apart from that, they have also many superstitious beliefs. Like, for example, when they left their house and met on way a serpent or a rat or a bird, and if they chance or if they chance upon anyone who sneezes, they return at once to their house. Why? Because they believe that something might befall them if they are going to or they would continue their journey. That is also the same with the idea nga, when you are uh, traveling and if, if you saw, kung nagalakat ka, and if there's uh, a black path that blocked your way, then you need to go home because maybe there is something bad that would happen. That's why they believe on auguries, they believe on evil omen, and they believe also on good omen. Now, our ancestors doesn't have calendars. That's why they have no idea of how uh, to really divide years into months and days. Now, in, in, their, part, in, the, in their case, they only do that by determining the cultivation of the soil, uh, by counting the moons, by the different effects produced upon the trees, and by that, they would be able to tell the years and months and dates. Uh, they don't have the calendars as we have right now. And apart from that, they don't have the idea of winter and summer. They don't have those things. Instead, they have sun time and water time. Now, of course, our ancestors offer sacrifices to proclaim a feast and offer to the diva what they had to eat. Now, um, Juan de Placentia here used the term diva to refer to the spirits in the Anitos that our ancestors worshipped during the time. Uh, Placentia called them as divas. And of course, I don't know if you're familiar with the practice in the rural areas particularly in the far-flung area of the province, uh, every time that they have harvest or they, there is a, every time that it's harvest season, they would do what, what we call panurong surong, when they tend to offer food to the spirits. That's actually a practice of our ancestors that we are still uh, doing right now. Uh, now, there were several reasons why our ancestors offer sacrifice and adore the idols or the spirits, among which, of course, includes personal matters. Uh, our ancestors had personal reasons why they offer uh, sacrifices to the idols or to the spirits or to the anitos. But apart from that, uh, other reasons include recovery of a sick person, prosperous voyage, good harvest, successful delivery in childbirth, and even a happy outcome in married life. Those were the reasons why our ancestors offer sacrifices and adoration. Now, here, uh, there were several distinctions of the priest of the devil, as uh, Placentia mentioned. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, we are, or our ancestors, worships uh, spirits, our anitos, but in the case of Placentia, he called them as devils. And those people performing uh, those functions are considered to be priests of the devils. Of course, we know we are very familiar with the Babaylan, who is also the same as Catalunan. Uh, uh, for, for the Visayan people, we call that as Babaylan. But for the Tagalog people, they refer, that, uh, they refer to that as Catalunan who was either a man or a woman. But apart from that, Placentia named, uh, named 11 other priests of the devil, or some of which we are very familiar of that because it's part of our 
uh, folklore. Like for example, manggagaway, uh, witches. Uh, they are examples of witches. Another example of uh, a witch or the same as manggagaway is a manyesalat. You have their mangkukulam. Uh, I am very sure that you know what, what's a mangkukulam is because you have the idea of kulam, di ba? Then we have also kukluban. Then we have silagan. Now try to understand, class, that they, some of this uh, uh, priest of the devils, according to uh, Placentia, could be found only in one place and could not be found in other places. We have manananggal or magtatanggal. I know you're very familiar with that. Uh, it's a being wherein it, uh, uh, his body or uh, a being wherein the body was divided or cut into two, wherein at night it flies. Then uh, there were some movies where in that, uh, in that movie you could see that some are uh, people that discovered the half body of the manananggal are being put with a soul. Right? Uh, apart from that, you have aswang or uswang, or they are equivalent to sorcerer. In our case, we tend to consider aswang and manananggal as just almost the same. Then manggagayuma, uh, you're familiar with that from the word gayuma, you have gayuma. If you love somebody and that somebody doesn't love you, then you uh, create love potions, uh, you, you do the, uh, what we call gayuma. Another one where uh, was sunat, or that's equivalent to preacher, then pangatawuhan, and of course pangatawuhan where the soothsayers or they predict the future. Those, those, uh, we have the term there, manghuhula, uh, manghuhula or pangatawuhan. Then we have bayugen or a man whose nature inclined towards that of a woman. Now those were the priests of the devils as mentioned by Juan de Placentia. Now apart from that, our natives also have their practice of burying the dead. Uh, and uh, the practice varies uh, from one place to another, as well as to, depending on the status of the person that will be buried. Like, for example, if the deceased was a chief, uh, he was buried beside his house, but apart from burying beside his house, he was placed beneath a little house or porch constructed for the purpose. Now, there were other practices being done, but apart from that, uh, the main idea there was this grip or this grip was always accompanied by eating and drinking. Now, of course, uh, Placentia also mentioned uh, some practices that were being practiced by the infidels. He would tend to refer to infidels as the Muslims. Uh, they have the idea of maka as paradise or valleys of rest, kasanaan or a uh, place of anguish. Then they have also the idea of sitan that, that dwells in the uh, place of kasanaan. Of course, they have the idea or uh, Placentia introduced the idea of ghost or vivet, vivet and uh, phantoms or tikbalang. And of course, a child that suffered uh, punishment and uh, laments at night known as Tianak, or we call that as Tianak. Now, this were among, oh, this, uh, this were the practices uh, practiced by our ancestors during those times, which were all documented by uh, Juan de Placentia. Placentia documents these things, and apart from documenting these things, he also wanted the alcaldes mayores to be familiar with it because on the first part of the relation uh, or relation, you could see there uh, the different uh, things pertaining to the government, uh, pertaining to the inheritance, pertaining to the slaves and marriages that were, as well as dowry that were being practiced by our natives. And of course, uh, the alcaldes mayores need to be familiar with that because if they will not be familiar with that, there is a tendency that they will be committing injustices among the natives because the Spanish civil code, uh, there were portions of that that were not applicable among our ancestors. Okay, now all the things that we know about our ancestors, uh, 
we know those things, the practices of our ancestors, we know that because of the work of Juan de Placentia.